All right, everybody, get your reading questions out. We are exploring today. So I brought my huge, my huge map. My son, before he left for college and then he left for the military, he wanted a world map for his room, so we got him a world map. Um, I have artwork. Be oh, I heard somebody say no. Oh, and this covers my whole board. Okay, <clears throat> this artist, i got to turn around and get with my cord. Um, I don't think that Dorothy Mills talks about this artist, but I had several pieces of art, and plus, I really like his art. It's pretty cool. And his name is fun to say. Um, if you can see, I'm going to write it. If you can see, I, I, I know. Jan Van Eyck. Jan Van Eyck. No, his name is not fun to say. Everybody, one, two, three. Jan Van Eyck. Oh, we didn't do it very well. Jan Van Eyck. Well, but you can hear me. Thank you. Okay, so I brought, I have two copies of one of his paintings, which we will look at first. I'm actually going to give it, I'm going to give the framed one to you guys. And then when you're done looking at it, pass it to that table. Um, so, but this is an enunciation. <clears throat> what I want you to notice, <clears throat> I'm sorry, my throat, I've got a thing, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, Von Eyck is very, very detailed. We have gotten to the point, here, I'll hold it for the camera. We've gotten to the point where it's um, like photograph almost, the, the realism and the detail. Um, and so in an Annunciation, obviously, that's the angel Gabriel coming to Mary and saying, you are going to have a baby. But what I want you to notice, and so you guys that have it, or you know, you can look up here too. We have, we have the angel and we have Mary, and they actually have little words coming out of their mouths. That's not realism, okay? Like when I speak, words don't actually visibly come out of my mouth. But, um, you know, he's saying, Ave Maria, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you, um, as he greeted her. And she's saying, you know, let it be to me according to your word. I don't remember exactly the words that are here they're backwards and it's I don't remember also they're very tiny but look above first of all you'll you'll see when we get this there are shafts of light coming down from the side with a an image of a dove sort of in the shafts of light the Holy Spirit is coming upon Mary so that she can she can conceive Jesus we have a window by itself up above we have one God but look below in three parts. It's very cool. It's very cool. It's very, lots of symbolism, but then lots of detail. Do you see what I mean? It's got the one window in the three. So we have one God in three persons. We have the beam of light of the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary. But yet the details are just astounding. Okay, the next one is, it's called mm, The Marriage of Giovanni Antolfini with Giovanna Senami, 1434. It is a wedding ceremony. In, in medieval times and Renaissance times, you didn't necessarily have to have, um, generally people could just come together in front of witnesses and say, we want to be married, and everybody's like, yeah, you're married now. Okay, great. Which would save their parents a lot of money, wouldn't it? Um, but this is, uh, as far as we know, a, a wedding scene. What I want you to look at when I pass it around is um, I the details. We've got, we've got a dog down here. By the way, she's not pregnant. Okay, I feel like I should always, because for years I thought, why is she pregnant? Okay, but she's, she's you know, Renaissance ladies wore lots of layers. Can you picture? like lot petticoats and everything, so that makes you look larger anyway. And then if you look closely, she's got, you can see the fold lifted up. She's, she's taken the fold of her clothes and she's put it like this. So, but then it's not flattering. <laughs> it's not, it's not flattering. She's not pregnant. Um, but, 
Yeah, I mean, as far as we know, this is in their, their sitting room or something. It's at their house or his house or, you know, their house they're going to share. But so you've got to have witnesses. You. Yes. We are the witnesses. Although, although there are witnesses because the mirror, you can see them in the mirror. You can see the backs of the couple and you can see other people too. I love it. The painter is, so I'll send this one this direction, okay? Yeah, this marker is not going to cut it, is it? You can't see anything, this orange marker. What have I done with it? I'm finding a... Okay, here we go. Jan von Eich. There we go. That's better. Jan. If you call him John or Jan, he's not going to care. He's dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was, I didn't, I didn't tell you, he is from Belgium. He's a Belgian painter. Right, I'll let that get part way around because I want to show you my piece de resistance. This is the star of the show. It's very cool. No, I don't do accents very well at all. <clears throat> I was forced to do a Scottish accent reading Redwall aloud to my kids. And it was not well. Every time he came onto the page, I frowned and my kids knew he was coming. Can't remember his name. There are words and I don't know what it says. I I did Yeah, uh, off to the off to the left. Yeah, I don't know, they look like bones. They almost like bones. Maybe that would be more flattering for her if she's a little height. Okay. Well, see, I don't want to break into one thing when they're still looking at the next thing. I'm just waiting for the painting to go around. Someday I have to get four or five copies of everything and. Uh, Okay, give the, I'll give this table a chance. Maybe you can look and listen out of one, like look with eyes and listen with ears. I don't know if that's possible. This last thing, this is an altar piece. So in, in churches, um, in Catholic churches still, but in all churches, you know, before the Reformation, uh, there, there, there wasn't a pulpit because the sermon isn't the important thing. The communion is the important thing. So they have an altar, a, a large table, and sometimes it was very ornate, but often there was pictures or statuary behind the altar, all right, um, to make a beautiful holy space. This is an altar piece. This was behind the altar at a church in Belgium. And on normal days, this is what you would see. It is closed. And at the top, we have two prophets and interestingly, two of the Sibyls from Roman mythology these are also present on the Sistine Chapel ceiling because early Christians believed that many of the prophecies from the Sibyls were, were sent by God. The, the, the Romans and the Sibyls just didn't know it. That you can speak truth, God can send you truth, and you might not even know that you're speaking the truth. We have another Annunciation. We have the angel, Gabriel and Mary. And the bottom, oh, I didn't look this up. I, I think it's, um, I think it's, John the Apostle and 
see. Peter, maybe, I can't remember, I'm sorry. And they look like statues, but they're actually paintings. And then on the outside, this is the guy and his wife who paid for this. Oh my God. I know, they paid for the altarpiece, they sponsored it, so they get to be praying at the altar all the time, which I love. But on feast days of the church, so um, celebrating, like St. Patrick's Day is a feast day. It's in honor of St. Patrick. Okay, St. Valentine's Day is a feast day. It's in honor of St. Valentine. They would open the altar piece. And then we have the story of salvation. We have on the outskirts Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve being expelled from the garden. All right, and so I'll pass this around, but you know, if you don't want to see Adam and Eve not wearing clothes, like you don't have to open it, okay? But I, they weren't, and so we're a little more skittish about that in our art than they were. Um, in the middle, we have um, uh, groups of angels, uh, or not in the middle, but closer to the middle. We have God. People argue about whether, well, did he mean this to be God the Father? Because God the Father is a spirit. It, probably the reigning Christ, but you know, representative of God. And we have Mary and John the Baptist. But the bottom is the really, really cool part. And the bottom, we have from both sides, people flocking to the center. And on one side, they're dressed very well. They have horses, they're obviously upper class people. And on, on this side, we have people who aren't dressed so well. They're obviously lower class people. It doesn't matter, they're all coming. They're all coming and in the middle, there's a crowd of people around a stage and on the stage is a cross and a lamb. They are all coming to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Yes, ma'am. Uh, as far as, yes, I believe Ghent, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that city's name, Ghent in Belgium, you can visit the, the altarpiece of Van Eyck. Van Eyck. All right, so I will send this around. Like I said, you can use, I don't remember. I don't know and I don't remember. I'll have to put my glasses and look closely. It's, it's got a date. Oh, we'll have to, somebody will have to look that up or I'll have to look that up. Mm -hmm. It's the one. Well, it's like a man. It's the one. No, no, it's not. And, and she can't help it that she's ugly. <laughs> let's, let's be nice. <laughs> okay, go ahead. While the altarpiece goes, comes around, go ahead and get your reading questions out and be ready. I know it takes a little extra time for us to do this, but I think it's really fun to look at what these people were looking at at the time. You know, what, what was the artwork of the time? I think it tells us a lot. All right, so while we'll have two things going on at the same time for time constraints. Um, as the altarpiece comes around, you can stop and look at it, but <clears throat> You can see we have a map of the world. This is a pretty accurate modern map of the world. I want to show you two maps from the past, okay? The first map, I'm going to bring it around just one at a time. This is a map of the world from 200 AD. Yeah, this is the world. Yeah, this is the world. Basically, it's the Mediterranean with Europe, Asia, and the north part of Africa. This, this is a map of the world. Although, if you have to go everywhere on foot or on a horse, it's not so small. If you can fly there, it's not so bad. Here's our map of the world. This is the world in 200 AD. It is Europe, Asia, and North part of Africa. That's it. That's what you get. No, because there's a huge desert. There's a huge desert. So they, a lot of times, they just thought it was ocean. So in, do you remember Dante? You may or may not remember Dante. Here, just a second. Stay with me, guys. Um, he, 
wrote a, a, a long poem called The Divine Comedy. And in it, basically, he treats the, um, the other side of the world as just ocean. Like the whole rest of the world is ocean. I'm sorry, I've just completely, I'm like a cat playing with window blinds and I've now, to go around this way. Okay, so this is the world as we know it in 200 AD. This is, I, I don't, I, well, they thought that the ocean flowed around it. I think you're putting too much stock on color. We also make things colorful because it looks nice, you know? This is the world in 1600. Well, we haven't charted everything yet. I'm not saying, but have we, have we improved? Yes, but like, I wonder if like when they realized that these two went together. What, that, what, what two went together? Oh, yeah, well, that's still a theory, yeah. But it looks like it. Yeah, we're doing better, aren't we? Like, this looks a little more like that. 1600, I think, more or less. Are we doing better? Give these people a thumbs up. There's been some exploring. There's been some exploring, hasn't there? Yeah, South America. Mm -hmm. Well, also, remember also something before you condemn too much. Also remember about different, oh, I'm sorry, different kinds of maps. You know, the Earth is a globe, right? We all know this. So have you ever, hey guys, hey guys, I know it's really distracting, but at least keep it to a minimum so everybody else can hear what I'm talking about. Um, when we take the world and peel it off, and spread it out flat, everything in the north and the south looks bigger than it is. Do you guys know about this, about different sorts of maps? So imagine if you peeled an orange and you, and you took the peel off all in one piece. All right, can you imagine that? Like you're really, really good at this. You are such a good orange peeler. Your piece comes off, but, but then the piece comes off and it's like the middle part of your orange is fine, but the, but the ends, you know, it's kind of, uh, that's a strange orange, but the ends are jagged, you know, because these ends folded together to form a globe. So, so when I peel the earth and I slap it on a map, it makes these places stretch out and look a lot bigger than they are. So that might have been part of the problem with the humongous North America here, you know, the, ki the kind of map that we have. But also, they were still, we'll talk about that in a minute, they were still working on finding out what's up here. They didn't quite know. They were finding out, but they didn't quite know. But does that make sense? So when you look, if you go home, if you have a globe and you have a, a map like this, you know, look at Greenland. Greenland is always a good thing to compare. Greenland isn't nearly as big as it looks like it is on this map. Because it, it has, everything is spread out. Go home and do that. If you have a globe in your house and a, and a map, look at Greenland on both of them. Look at Greenland on a globe and then Greenland on a map, and you'll see how it gets spread out. Anyway, all, at the same time as everything else we've been talking about this year, people are trotting the globe, as they say, and they are finding out what's out there. And um, the first question I asked you was, what three new developments made all this possible. Yeah, um, Adeline. Okay, compass. Compass is huge because a compass tells us what direction we're going in. And if I'm going to sail far, far away from land, I mean, I can use the sun, but what if it's cloudy? And I can use the stars, but what if it's cloudy? And and this would be very scary if I didn't quite know which direction I was going, especially if a storm took me and knocked me around for a week. Then, on top of it, we need to know how far north or south we are, don't we? And so, um, I think that's what an astrolabe does. Uh, it, 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 it's an instrument that you can uh, use the stars 
to determine your latitude, okay, how far north or south. Um, at the same time, the Portuguese, <coughs> so Portugal is this country, you know, right at the edge of Spain. Portugal is almost all coastline. It's long and skinny in its coastline. It's set up to go to sea, right? <coughs> they started building ships called caravels that were very, very sturdy and could withstand storms and go long distances. They were not very big. They were alarmingly not big, considering these people spent months and months and months and sometimes years at sea. But they got the job done. Um, a few years ago, I think I might have mentioned this, a few years ago in Davenport, it must have been five years ago now, uh, the Nina, a replica of the Nina, it was the Nina or the Pinta, I can't remember, it wasn't the Santa Maria, was in, was in Davenport. And they, they have replicas that they just sail around. You can sign on to be on their crew for a year and, and, just, and just sail around and visit ports and let people, people pay to come on. So my son and I went, it wasn't very big. It took them three months to get to America, Columbus's crew. I wouldn't want to spend three months out on the open sea in that boat, but but it was an improvement over what they had before. Yes, ma'am. Oh no, no. We just you know, it was just docked and you could go on. Oh yes, the crew member stays with it. You can sign on, they pay you. I don't know what amenities it had. There was, a, there was a crew area that we weren't allowed to go. Oh, yeah. Like college, stu college students did or people that wanted to take a gap year between, between high school and college signed on or retired people. There's like, yeah, I'm going to spend a year sailing around with Anina. It sounded very cool to me. I was <laughs> kind of ready, yeah. except for maybe the amenities. You know, I need to see the bathrooms before I, before I sign on. Um, so in Portugal, Around the year 1400, there was a prince, and his name was Prince Henry. He was not, uh, he was in the royal family, obviously, but he was not in line unless a lot of people died. You know, he wasn't going to be king. So he needed something to do with his life and his time, and he decided to spend it uh, sponsoring navigators. He set up uh, a, a fortress, a building on the coast, and he hired sailors to go out and explore. And he said, you have to write down everything you see. I want you to fill out all the navigational charts. I want you to take readings every day and every night. I want to know where you were, and then you come back and report to me. Cool. He didn't go out himself. He was, he was the mastermind, you know? So, so he started sending sailors out, and they started working their way around the coast of Africa. They found the islands out here, but mostly they started working their way around. This is, this is scary territory. And like Ella said, they didn't really know what was down here because desert. You don't, you don't just, I mean, there's Arab caravans that know where the oases are, but you know what I mean? You didn't just go as an explorer, I'm gonna land here, I'm just gonna march straight south. So they started working their way around the coast of Africa and then going back to Prince Henry and reporting what they found. And so they started building that map, that second map that I showed you, as opposed to the first map, you know, that only had this, basically. They found out there were people there. And I'm gonna touch on this. I, not, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, not because it's not an important thing, but because I have a lot to talk about. It also started the first slave trade, all right? Because <clears throat> just like in, in North America, there isn't just one group of people, the Africans, just like there isn't one group of people, the American Indians. They're different groups and they don't always get along. And they were at war and, and a lot of the people would, would capture and enslave the other side, right? And when people came and said, well, we'll take them off your hands, they made a deal. The people on the coast made a deal. So it is, it, it is, a, it is a tragedy that we're just not going to spend a lot of time this year talking about, because um, I think you guys are aware, all right, and because we have other, other things to talk about. But, but this was the beginning as they started exploring and they started finding the people there. They found people very willing to sell other people to them. 
and of course it grew and grew and grew over the next several hundred years. Um, so why do the Portuguese want to sail to India? Why do they care about working their way around? Yeah, Lauren, spices. So what's the big deal about spices? Can't we live without spices? No, we can't live. Why not? Okay, two words, no refrigeration. Okay, so salt is a preservative, and they have salt, but First of all, people love spices. It makes your food taste exotic and nice. But when you killed that cow, I don't know how long ago, but that, <laughs> that meat's been sitting there for a while. You know, you might want to just sprinkle something on it, make it a little more palatable so you can eat it. Our standards are a lot higher than people of the past, what, what we will eat. Do you remember when we read Robin Hood? And do you remember they kept stopping? They would go out in the morning and then they'd stop in the middle of the day or, or Robin would find someone and they'd just get out, I always described it as his wallet, like his little pack, and they'd just get out meat pies and stuff. And did you ever stop and think, should it have been in the fridge? Should you eat that? They weren't getting sick all the time. But it would help if you had spices, right? Not to mention, people were willing to pay top money for things like pepper and cinnamon. And if you could travel to India and get them, you can buy them cheap, and you can come home and sell them not cheap. And you get to keep the rest of the money, right? For a long time, they've been bringing these things to Europe. Tea a little bit later, but, but the spices had been traveling. But they'd been traveling um, you know, by sea, and then overland, either here or here, and then um, often through Constantinople. But when the Turks took over, remember the Turks? When they took over this area, they said, yeah, we don't really want you just coming through here. Or if you want to come through, we're going to heavily tax you to come through. I said, shoot, there must, be a, there must be another way to get there. I think there's another way to get there. So. We start exploring, right? Until we can find out how far south does this go? If we go far enough south, can we get there this direction? That's what the Portuguese wanted to find out. And, okay, so what was the original name of the Cape of Good Hope when they finally got there? Yeah, tell me. It's the name. Cape of Storms. Cape of Good Hope is the tip of Africa where South Africa is. And apparently, the tip of, of Africa and the tip of South America are really, really, the weather is not good a lot of the time. And so they, when the Portuguese finally got around, they came back and they reported, yeah, we're gonna call it the Cape of Storms. Portuguese kings, no, nobody wants to go to the Cape of Storms. Who wants to sign on for the crew for the Cape of Storms? The Cape of Good Hope. That's, that sounds nice. Also, it was hopeful because when they realized, when the expedition realized, holy cow, we have come around as far south as we can go and now we're headed north again, they knew they'd found the bottom. They weren't sure what they were gonna find over here, but they knew they'd found the bottom, right? And that's a good hope for Portugal, right? Because maybe they're gonna find their route and they're gonna make a boatload of money selling spices. So that's a good hope, too. Sort of like the story where uh, they named Greenland Greenland, even though apparently Iceland is, has a better climate than Greenland, because nobody wants to move to the even worse, even icier than Iceland. Nobody signs up for that trip. All right, I want to correct, well, sort of correct Miss Mills again. It says, uh, the earliest Portuguese sailors set out in caravels, three-masted ships varying in size from about 65 to 100 feet in length. They still thought of the world as flat and so sailed fairly close to shore. Okay, so we talked about this, and I know I keep pounding this. The educated people of the time did not, did not believe the world was flat. Okay, that's sort of a myth that we have concocted 
that we are so smart and everybody in the past was stupid. The ancient Greeks knew the world was round. And everybody who read their writings and, and was educated all knew the world was round. Columbus wasn't afraid he was going to fall off the edge of the earth. That said, the average sailor who maybe couldn't read and write and had had little or no education might suspect that the earth was flat and he might fall off the edge. I'm not, I'm not saying that no one felt that way. But the people in charge of these expeditions didn't believe it. So how, let me see, I think I'm skipping up on my next one. Uh, so do you remember that, I didn't ask you, did I? Who is the guy who finally made it to India? Does anybody remember? Yeah, Jesse? That's okay. Anybody else? You remember? Vasco da Gama finally made it to India. Finally made it to India, India, and there must have been rejoicing in Portugal. Oh my goodness, we, we can do it. We can make it. And we don't have to depend on the goodwill of the Turks to get our spices, and Europe is gonna come knocking on our door looking for spices, yes. Did a map? Well, they're they're making so they're making maps as they go along. So every every expedition that goes a little bit farther, because remember Prince Henry's rules, you write it down and you map it, and then you report back to me, and I will have my map makers here that I'm sponsoring. You know, put all the information together. So as they go, the map is. Uh, so my family plays Age of Empires on the computer, and I think so. It, it's. It, you send out a scout, you know, and, and the map spreads. You can see more and more of the world on this computer game as your scout goes and it fleshes out the map. It's kind of like what was happening here. They're sending scouts out, they're sending explorers, you know, and they, and they push back the boundaries and then they come back and they record it, right? But it's gonna take a long time to get this kind of accuracy, right? Yeah. Well, because it was controlled by the Turks. I know. That's a good idea. Yeah, I think that it, it was a matter of money. I think that if they, if you could pay enough, even even the Turks would allow Christians to live in their territories if you paid enough. But they were much more perse persecutory. That's not even a word. They, they persecuted Christians more vehemently, all right, than the Muslims that had come before. So it was kind of dangerous and, and really expensive. So it was better it was better for Europe to try to avoid them altogether. It does seem like a crazy long trip to us. Um, and obviously there's a, you know, a canal and we, we have ways to get through now that I was going to say the whole world is working together. The whole world is not working together, is it? But, um, but to avoid it altogether, to avoid the expense and the, and the possible violence that they would encounter as Christians. Uh, so at the same time, oh, we got to, I'm, I'm jumping around in our questions today. I'm sorry. We'll, we'll get them all covered. But our friend Isabella, Queen Isabella of Spain, that you remember, was... Uh, apparently had it together more than her husband, Ferdinand, if you recall from that chapter, that she was just a better organizer and manager, which explains why Columbus went to her. Give me money, because I have an idea. You know, the Portuguese got their whole East travel thing going, but I'm really sure if we just, if we just sail West, we're gonna get there. This makes total sense. If you don't know this is in the way, and also, uh, we talked about this before too, I think, um, and the ancient Greeks calculated the diameter of the earth very accurately. But other people had done their own calculations. And unfortunately, Columbus was following calculations that made the earth seem a lot smaller around than it really is. 
So he really didn't think it was that far. And of course, he didn't know this was in the way. So he said, how about we undercut the whole Portuguese sailing east thing? He'll just go west and we'll beat him to it. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It must have been documented somehow or we wouldn't know about it today. That makes sense, right? But uh, speaking off the top of my head, I'm suspecting that it just didn't get either translated into other languages that people were reading or it just, uh, you know, strangely, some documents just get lost. For centuries they get lost and then somebody wanders into a library and they find this old manuscript and it's hundreds of year old poem or document that we just didn't even know existed. I do not know the answer to your question though, Red. But obviously it was not common knowledge. So Columbus um, took his three ships and he my Tuesday kids like to argue with me. They hate Columbus. Right. Columbus haters. And I told them, well, but think about it. Think about the guts it takes to get in a ship, three ships, and just head out, and you're really not sure what's going to be there. And you're not sure how long it's going to take you. And you've got to convince the guys on your crew not to freak out and mutiny. Right? You have to be a pretty good manager of people. And you've got to have a certain amount of charisma just to just to convince people that this is a doable thing. Yeah, Adeline. No, because they were there was trade with China and and not so much Japan as well. But I think the idea was he knew that he was going to have to go not just due west, but southwest. All right, to hit, obviously, to hit down here. But any, anywhere in this area was fair game. And, and as a matter of fact, he thought he was on these islands when he was on those islands, which made perfect sense. But that's a good question. Now, obviously, if they just went straight west, they're going to end up up here in China and Japan. But he knew, remember, they have good... Um, navigational instruments now, so they can know how far they've gone and how, uh, what their latitude is. Uh, yeah? Yeah. How, what? But they did know the Earth was around. Oh, no, no. All educated people knew the Earth was around. Oh, yes, very well. Very well. Yeah, no, no. No, he did not think, this wouldn't work if the world wasn't round. If you think about it, they already knew the Portuguese could get there this way. So, you know, it, it makes sense. Um, just from the, the bad things that happened later to the Indians, they, they, unless somebody wants to talk about that, we'll let that go. There were terrible things, but um, I, I won't, you guys know the story of Columbus. Um, Columbus went back and forth uh, numerous times, but he fell into disrepute, he, even in his own lifetime. People started not liking him for a couple of reasons. And this, I will disparage Columbus in a couple of things. Columbus had a very high opinion of himself, apparently. He, he demanded to be called Admiral of the Ocean Sea, Isabella was like, okay. He started saying his name. I'm, I'm not going to pass this around. This long, drawn out uh, uh, with initials and letters that nobody's even sure what it meant. This is how he signed his name. He had all his titles, you know. But he, he left some guys in charge. So he thinks, you got to remember what he thinks. He thinks he has found this. He, he thinks he's, he is here. So he leaves some guys in charge. He says, build a, build a camp, build a fort, 
I'm gonna go back and tell them, boom, did it. And those people, they had like some gold nose rings, earrings, there's gold. Right, forget the spices, let's go for the gold. And I'm gonna report and I'm gonna get more resources and I'm gonna come back. In his absence, the guys he left behind were not good to the natives. They started beating them and enslaving them. Like, why should I do the hard work when these guys are just laying around? Make them do the work. If they don't want to, we've got ways. This is what was going on in Columbus's absence. Then, of course, the natives say, uh, no. And they fight back, understandably. People start dying. All right. So Columbus managed the people on his ship well. I, I skipped that part. He kept two sets of books. He kept two travel logs. He kept one in which he wrote their real distance. This is how far we've actually gone. And then he kept one where everything was shortened to show the sailors. So they didn't think they'd gone so far. So they wouldn't freak out. However, after three months went by and they had seen no land. Yeah, no, during the journey. During the journey as he kept the daily log, this is how far we traveled. He had a private one, this is how far we've really traveled. And the public one, oh, look, see, we haven't gone that far. <clears throat> yes, you have, but we're not gonna tell you. But towards the end of the trip, three months in, no land, no land, there's no land. <laughs> there's nothing to see. And his sailors started getting very, very antsy. So much so that they're threatening to take control of the ship and turn around and go home. It's the last thing Columbus wants to happen. He can feel it. I've got to be almost there. I've got to be almost there. So he staved him off with promises till finally in October they sight land. So he was a good manager, but maybe he was not such a good judge of men. Do you know? Because the people he left behind did not did not run things in a way that was going to make this a, a, a doable thing, to have a, a presence there. They created fear and hatred instead of you know, trying to reach out to them, which is really sad because um, one of the reasons, people today kind of poo-poo this reason, but it was a real reason um, people wanted to go to other places in the world and explore. And that is to carry the gospel. And so, I'm sorry, this map is in the way, but I'll do it. So, Christopher, uh, uh, he spelled like that, suppose we spelled like that today, don't we? Um, it doesn't matter. Um, fur is, is the Greek for bearing or bearer. Christopher is what? A Christ bearer. And he really, he and, and the other explorers that came, this was important, but for many of them it was back here, in the back of their minds. What they really wanted was money, all right? But there were also plenty whose it wasn't in the back of their minds. Um, which, let's switch it up. It's hard because all this is happening, boom, 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 very fast. Let's talk about Spain now, all right? Spain sent out Columbus, and other explorers followed. Of course, the Portuguese went in on this, too. It was like, wait a minute. We were the Prince Henry guys. We, we're pioneers here. Where's our cut? So I think I mentioned this before. Finally, the Pope was appealed to. Which part of this does Portugal get, and which part does Spain get? And they ended up running a latitude line, like right about there. I know, which is, it seems very unfair. Uh, so Portugal gets this side and Spain gets this side. But Portugal has this going for them, right? You don't look convinced at all. I was like, no, that's not fair. Um, uh, so so this, this all fell to Spain. So the Spanish send over, and we have which, uh, he's one of the ones I listed at the bottom of your sheet. Which, which one is the guy who's known for M Mexico? 
conquering Mexico. Cortez. Um, Cortez showed up, and uh, there was a huge civilization in Mexico, the Aztecs. What did you say? The Incas. The Incas are in Peru. The Incas are down here. But yes, they had a huge civilization too. But um, so it's centered in what is today Mexico City. Mexico City was a lake once upon a time, and it was an island in the lake they built up, and it had four uh, causeways, four bridges coming off the lake. And uh, this was the, the capital of the Aztec Empire. And I mean empire, because they had conquered all their neighbors. And their neighbors didn't like that very much. Partly because nobody likes to get conquered, but partly because they, they were the sacrifices. <laughs> The Aztecs sacrificed people. They just kind of just ripped their hearts right out there. And there's descriptions of like thousands of sacrifices at a time. Where the big temples, you've probably seen pictures. They would build um, uh, you know, like pyramids with flat tops, you know, and stairs. So you'd have, you know, an altar, a building up here, and they would just sacrifice and sacrifice and sacrifice. Largely people captured in war. When Cortez showed up, these people were willing to join anybody if it meant bringing the Aztecs down. We don't want to be sacrifices anymore, right? So a lot of the people fighting and bringing the Aztec Empire down are not Spanish. There are other Mexican peoples who have been conquered and have an axe to grind. Instead of having the axe to grind against them. Um, the other problem for the Aztecs, not for Cortez, is they had a god named Quetzalcoatl. Lots of feathers, feathered serpent god. And they really believed he was going to come back someday. And they believed he was going to come back from the east towards the west. They were expecting I don't know that they were on the lookout and they got up every morning to see if he was on the way. But this was in their minds that this, this the cycle of time is coming around and I think Quetzalcoatl is going to return. And then shows this, this guy shows up. First of all, he looks like none of them, right? He doesn't have the same facial features and skin color and everything. Second of all, he's riding a horse. They'd never seen a horse. There were no horses over here before the Europeans came. They brought horses with them. And I think we talked about this before. Imagine you had never, ever seen a horse and you had, in addition, never seen a person sitting on a horse. It's a centaur. I'm sorry, that's a centaur. That's not a person riding, that is a weird creature. And then not to mention that they're wearing, you know, armor. This is the weirdest looking creature they have ever seen. This cannot be human. This cannot be normal. This must be divine. And they were seriously alarmed that if they offended these beings, they were offending the gods. You have to remember what they were thinking. Yeah, Rhett. What, to Cortez? Uh, maybe, I don't know. Maybe he already had power in his head. Um, I don't know a lot about Cortez as a person, more just what he did. So I, I can't speak to you know what he was thinking, but it would be hard for it not to. Let's admit it. Um, do you remember when um, Paul and Barnabas, was it Paul and, uh, yeah, it was before Silas, um, showed up in a Greek city in, in the book of Acts and they thought that they were Zeus and Hermes? And they just wanted to fall down and worship them. It, you know, if you think about it, on one hand, Paul could have, I don't know, played along with it just a little bit to get a hearing. No, no, we don't do that. We, we, don't, we don't accept, first of all, those aren't really gods, but second of all, we don't accept any divine honors because we're not, we're not divine. Cortez, however, was not like Paul. I will go that far. He was perfectly willing to, to play along with it if it got him what he wanted. So the ruler of the Aztecs was a man named Montezuma. 
And if he had gone out maybe with his forces right at the beginning and said, we are gonna nip this in the bud. <laughs> we are gonna force all our allies, our allies, you know, code for conquered peoples, to come out and fight these guys. The, to fight the Spanish. We're gonna, we're gonna go out and fight them. If he had done that at the beginning, maybe things would have turned out differently. Although the Spanish had rifles, which doesn't help. But he didn't. He didn't because he thought, what if this is the god Quetzalcoatl and his entourage? Maybe I should send him a gift. So he started out sending him gifts, and oh boy, he sent him gold, which is what they want. It's like, oh yeah, I bet they got more. All right. So <clears throat> things degenerate from a uneasy truce to Montezuma saying, yeah, I don't think these guys are gods. But by that time, it was too late. It was too late to do anything about it. They took him prisoner and used him as leverage with the people to get them to do what they want. And to make a long story short, that was the end of the Aztec Empire. Um, Pizarro, I remember, is, the, is our Peru, the Incas, something similar. They had silver, silver mines, I think, in, in Peru. And uh, the god, not the I think they're gods thing, but a similar thing. We come, these strange, strange people, we don't know where they're from, but they have strange animals that they can ride. They also have weapons that are very compelling. You know, they can, they can kill us from a distance. Well, it, rifles, but I mean, imagine, imagine, and see this is where we have to use our imaginations. Imagine you've never seen a gun or heard a gunshot and a, and a rifle blast goes off. Just the noise. Have you ever been to, have you ever been to a shooting range or something like that, you know? And they, they make you wear ear protection, right? It's, la well, they don't make you wear, wear, you should wear ear protection. It depends on, I guess. No, I just, I haven't been. My, my kids and my husband have been, but. It's loud and startling. And you have to remember that even if I have bow and arrows in my hands, when that thing goes off, I hit the ground and I'm terrified. You know, I just remember, like there's moments when you don't think things out. Do you know what I mean? You just, you just react. Oh my gosh, what was that? and you drop it and you run. And you don't necessarily think, yeah, but I'm really good with the arrows and I've got, you know, I can throw my hatchet, my de whatever. You don't, you just run. <laughs> and in the meantime, the other side gets the advantage. Right? So just, just so we have to use our imagination. You know, it seems, well, why don't they do this? Why don't they do that? But when you're there doing it, it's a completely different thing, right? So. Little by little, South America and Central America are falling to European powers, right? And in the meantime, they are exploring. So let's, where's my paper? Um, let's go through the um, list. You know, the, the list at the bottom, the six guys? Uh, we already talked about Cortez. Ponce de Leon, right. Florida means flowery, Florida. Uh, what, does anybody remember what he was looking for in Florida? The Fountain of Youth. Oh yeah, Florida, Florida. That's why it's called Florida. They named it Florida, yes. And for a long time, the Spanish held Florida, even when the rest of North America was being colonized by England and, and France. Um, how about DeSoto? Yeah. Mississippi River, Balboa. Alice. Pacific Ocean. So this is this is fun. He he went across the the Isthmus of Panama, and and looked and he's holy cow, holy cow. There's another ocean over there. What? We we thought we thought we were we didn't know. There's a whole ocean, and it's even farther across than this one. It's been cra crazy. Bizarre. We talked about Cabot. Yeah, Lord. In where? Um, more, more than, more than north. 
I think. Newfoundland, up here. Oddly, maybe he went both places. We'll have to check, all right? Um, because while Spain, Portugal has their thing, right? We're going, we're good. And we get this little chunk. That's nice. I believe, am I, I believe that Portuguese is the, is the official language of Brazil. Is this true? All right, and that's why, because a, a hunk of Brazil belonged to Portugal. All right, we can thank the Pope for that. But, but Spain's getting the rest, and England or France said, what's the deal? <laughs> what, do we, what do we get? So they started sending out explorers too. Now, smart idea. We got the Portuguese. They're doing their thing. Oh, wait a minute. Before we go here, we have to talk about Magellan. Yes. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, well, not North America, but they'd already been to Florida. The Spanish had been to California. This is why there are so many Spanish names of places in Texas and New Mexico and Arizona and California, because, oh, yeah, we've got time. The Spanish, remember I told you there were two kinds of people coming? Some, they have gold in the front of their mind and the Christ bearing in the back. Another group of people that came from Spain that were front and center Christ bearers were uh, Catholic missionaries, Jesuit missionaries that came and they set up missions in South America and Central America and Southern Southern North America. And they really, really fought their home government to treat these people better, to treat the native population better. They got persecuted in some cases for it. In some cases, the mission would just get shut down because the government, like, we're not pouring any more money into that. These missionaries said, what's really important? Gold or these people's souls, for crying out loud? Do you think they're going to ever be attracted to Christianity if we treat them like this? They stood up for it. And this is where so many of these Spanish names in Southern California and Texas, they are old Spanish missionary outreaches to the native population. But unfortunately, often their voices got drowned out by the people with gold in the front, right? So, I said we need to talk about Magellan before we jump over to England. Remind me, if my train of thought derails, we're gonna talk about England after this. There's land in our way. This becomes very clear. As people are exploring and they're going along the coast and up in Florida, there's land and there seems to be quite a bit of it in our way for the whole sailing west to get to the Indies. What are we gonna do about it? Well, let's find out how far south the land goes, right? So, here, I gotta look this up. I put a flag here. Okay. In 1519, Ferdinand Magellan left Spain with five ships and 270 men. And he was headed for the Spice Islands. However long it takes them to find a way around. We know we can get there. We know we can get there. So they have to spend winters in various places, all right? Keep in mind, do you, do you see Antarctica right here? It's not very far from the southern tip of South America to, Antar to the Antarctic Circle. I think it's 500, I read it's 500 miles from the tip of South America to the Antarctic Circle. So we're talking about like being up here in Northern Alaska. It's cold and stormy and the ice sheets creep up and it gets dangerous. So they can't do this all in one year. 
They stop on the, on the coast here with southern Argentina. And uh, his men wrote down what happened, the ones who made it. We'll talk about that in a minute. One day, without anyone expecting it, we saw a giant who was on the shore, quite naked, who danced, leaped, and sang. And while he sang, he threw sand and dust on his head. Our captain sent one of his men toward him, asking him to leap and sing like the other, in order to reassure him and show him friendship, which he did. Immediately, the man of the ship, dancing, led this giant to a small island where the captain awaited him. And when he was in front of us, he began to marvel and be afraid. And he raised one finger upward, believing that we came from heaven. And he was so tall, the tall of us, tallest of us came up only to his waist. In a very large face, painted round with red, and his eyes also were painted round with yellow. And in the middle of his cheeks, he had two hearts painted. OK, he had hardly any hairs on his head, and they were painted white. The captain caused the giant to be given food and drink, and then he showed him other things, among them a steel mirror, wherein the giant, seeing himself, was greatly terrified, leaping back so that he threw four of our men to the ground. The captain named the people of this sort Patagoni. They're the giants. If you look on this map, it still says Patagonia. There. Now, my note here on the side says, uh, the South American natives wore bushy furs and had painted faces, although this guy said he was quite naked, so he wasn't wearing furs. Maybe at first they seemed like monsters. Magellan's crew thought the Patagonians' feet were especially big, but what really made their feet look big was their roomy moccasins stuffed with straw to keep out the cold. They had huge, they looked like they had huge feet, but they just had insulation. What? Yes. <laughs> so they finally make it around the tip of South America. And they get to the Philippines. Um, I can't find the Philippines. Help me, somebody who's good at. See, I used to know all this when my kids were little. This is what happens when your kids grow up and you stop doing the. Oh, yes, the Philippines are much closer to Asia than I thought. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry. I feel silly now. Um, this is why you should always do your geography, right? So you'll be standing in front of people saying, I can't find the Philippines. Uh, they, they land in the Philippines. And um, two, unfortunately, two groups of people were at war with each other in the Philippines. And they convinced Magellan to join their side, one of the sides. And he went to battle with them, and he got killed. At this point, one of his ships had given up and gone home. They, they didn't even make it around South America. Oh, we're out of here. We got giants. We got, oh yeah, I, 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 well, oh, when he was in the Philippines? Um, I don't think so. And so and another ship had been wrecked. They lose their commander in the Philippines, but they press on. They press on. And finally, think it was three years or four years. No. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. One ship and 18 guys. That's all out of 270. That's all that lived. He was three or four years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, all that, all that. Okay, all that made the trip and lived. Okay. They died. You know, you guys know the stories. Sailors, you you get a disease called scurvy. You know, when you don't have citrus fruit. Do you know about scurvy? Make your teeth fall out. Isn't that horrid? So. Always drink your orange juice. You know, it's scurvy. Anyway, vitamin C in citrus fruits uh, protects you against scurvy, and sailors would get scurvy, and it caused a softening of your tissues, and their teeth would fall out, and it eventually is fatal. I mean, it's it's a a nutrient that our bodies have to have to live, and sailors would get sick and die, and it took them a while to figure out that 
that you had to have this to live. You know, we need to stop, we need to stop, and, you know, because you can't keep oranges for three years in the tropics, right? That's just nasty. Yeah. They, were, they were gone for a long time. Well, yes, so, but you don't eat it if you don't know you need it. Do you see? Well, they did, but also remember this. This map doesn't, we have, well, I'm not finding anything. It's got to be cute. Oh, here we go. Um, here's, this is, this, oh, I can't see anything without these anymore. Okay, this is a thousand miles. So my my index finger is a thousand miles. So I mean, just do 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 do. You know how many thousands of miles we're going, and uh, maybe we'll get lucky. Remember, we're Magellan's crew. We don't know these islands are there. If we hit them, it's just luck. And we might just miss them all. Do, do you see the problem? And so we have our you know our hardtack or you know whatever our our uh, grains and 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 we stop and we replenish when we can we have to stop and fill our water we can't carry years worth of water on board but but they didn't know for a long time what was making sailors so ill um, so so a lot of them die I mean some in this in the skirmish in the Philippines with their with their leader but a lot of them just died from the wear and tear and from illness on the trip yeah right Yes. Um, the, the answer, I think your question is, how can they possibly do that and live? Sometimes they didn't. <laughs> Um, you can't drink salt water because that will make you very ill. And so there are stories of sometimes being reduced to catching rainwater and just really hoping it rains. But when you are lucky enough to hit an island, any sort of land, and of course they have, um, even before they had really, really good um, telescopes, you know, it, when you're at sea, you learn to see the telltale signs of land in the distance, even over the horizon. Do you know what I mean? A different look in the atmosphere, or, 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 yeah, or, or gulls, the presence of, of more gulls than usual. And so I, I was being, it was true, you could miss all the islands, but probably you're not going to miss all the islands. You're gonna see. So you, you fill up when you can, but there are stories of starvation. Um, illness and starvation and dehydration. It was a terribly dangerous thing. This is, oh, go ahead. Yes, you could. And, and you mentioned the size, these, by our standards, these are not large ships. It's, it's terrifying. Um, some of these explorers might have been mean to the people they found. And I don't mean to belittle that at all. And they might have been a little bit full of themselves for what they accomplished occasionally. But man, did they have guts. That's all I, all I have to say. No, I you know and a lot of the sailors did, did. I mean, they were young men with no, with no wives or children often. Um, so I, I'm gonna talk about England. My train stayed. Uh, I brought this. Uh, when I went to visit the Nina or the Pinta, I think it was the Nina in Davenport, I bought this. This is a replica coin. Apparently in Spain, they minted coins uh, soon after the, the conquest began. They minted coins specifically for use circulation in the New World. This is a replica coin that they were minting in Spain, and it was meant to be money for their colonies in the New World. And so I will just send that around. 
while I talk, so try to, I know if you're looking at that, that's distracting, but try to stay with me. Um, so England, England and France want a piece of the pie, right? We know now, we know now how far south South America goes. And we've tried 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 and we can't get through. No way through. There's now, right? There's a canal, but not then. So the French started sending explorers, mostly uh, Canada. Finally, they came down the Mississippi River. We're not going to talk about them as much. As back to Mr. Cabot, he was actually Italian, but he he Englishized his name Cabotti, Giovanni Cabotti, to fit in with the English, and he convinced the English to send him on an exploratory journey. Here's the thing. If we can get around down here, surely we can get around up here. Doesn't it seem like you should? Like, there should be a top. There's a bottom. I think there's a top. It, this is totally reasonable. So this started the search for the Northwest Passage, okay? If we go Northwest, unfortunately for these poor guys, oh my gosh, look, look at it. You get in and, and then, okay, so you're going through here, but remember, we're far north. You're up there, and one day it's water, two days later it's ice. Maybe the next morning it's ice, and I'm stuck. What am I going to do? Am I going to load my guys up? Because it's not thawing for a long time. And it's scary. It's dark. You know, I told you guys, I, when I was a little girl, I lived in Alaska. And I didn't live that far north. We lived in Anchorage. And it didn't get night, dark at night in the summer. It got twilighty. Maybe, maybe between 1 and 3, it got kind of dark. And in the winter, I went to school in the dark and I came home in the dark. And we packed flashlights in our backpacks. And the street lights were on. Because it was light maybe from 10 to 2. And I was down here, so these poor guys, it's cold, it's dark. Well, hey, let's just get out of the ship and march, march somewhere. Where are we going to march before we all die? It's awful. So, but, but it keeps luring you in. There's, there's Hudson Bay, named for another explorer, Henry Hudson. There's rivers, and you, and you keep getting sucked in and sucked in until you get stuck in the ice. It's horrifying. Yeah, it's not, this is not a good walking place. This, well, they tried. They, often they tried, but walk to where? And, and if you are not, I mean, when school, okay, back to me. In school, we saw movies, you guys, maybe some of you have been in schools. So they probably don't show film strips in schools anymore, how dated I am. Um, we had movies to help us know whether or not we might be getting frostbite or hypothermia. Two illnesses that you get, two, two afflictions that you get from the cold. And we saw the same movie every year about the people climbing the mountain. And the first thing she does is she forgets her gloves because the first sign of hypothermia is forgetfulness. And same thing, we're like, yeah, 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 we know. <laughs> we're not paying attention. But these things will kill you. Finally, you get hypothermia, your inner body temperature, and you don't really know what's happening to you. You just feel really tired. I just start forgetting things, and I just, I just want to take a nap. And you lay down in the cold, and you never wake up. Yes, okay, okay. So, so... Um, so Cabot uh, was the first of a long string of French and English explorers to try to find their way through. Cabot did find, and Rhett reminded us, not the first to find, the Vikings were the first to find, Newfoundland, which is the island here off the coast of Canada, uh, which is where I was born. Although I don't remember, I was born when I was a baby. We left about six weeks old, but I hope I get to go back there again someday. Um, the gold and the silver eventually starts to run out. But up here, fish and lumber, 
that made England and France and, and animal skins? Uh, they say that the, the, the Vikings talked about seeing places that there were grapes, which is why we think that they worked their way down the coast some. Mm -hmm. But they imported, one last thing, I want to talk about King Arthur too. Uh, they imported many, many things. I marked one place here. I have a list of all the things that Europe brought to the New World, not all the things, but many things, and then things that Europe didn't have, and they took home with them from the New World. Okay, so these are things that went from the Old World to the New. The natives over here did not have any of these things before Europe came. Horses, cattle, pigs, sheep, chickens, honeybees, wheat, Asian rice, barley, oats, soybean, sugarcane, onions, lettuce, okra, peaches, pears, watermelon, citrus fruit, rye, bananas, olives, and chickpeas. They have any of these things? Yes, Matthias. That is a really good question. Well, you know, if you keep a hive can be fairly self, maybe, maybe they block them in the hive. Oh, now this, this opens up a real puzzle to me, Matthias. You know what? I know. I don't want to be on the ship bringing the honeybees. Not signing. Not signing up for that. Okay, here are things that the new world had that the old world discovered from them. Corn, potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, chocolate, vanilla, tobacco, beans, pumpkin, avocado, peanuts, cashews, pineapple, blueberries, sunflowers, wild rice, squashes, marigolds, petunias, turkey, and sweet potatoes. <laughs> Well, I'm so glad you asked that question because listen to, I, this is one of my other flags. Where is it? Okay. According, I'm reading the little sidebar. According to an ancient tale, Quetzalcoatl, remember our feathered serpent gun, stole the cocoa tree from his brother and, gave, and sister gods and gave it to the Toltecs, an Aztec people, and taught them to make chocolate. Wherever it came from, chocolate was prized. The Aztecs demanded cocoa from other peoples as a form of tribute. I used to have a joke in my family that when I'm queen of the world, the things that I will change, they're usually trivial things that I won't trouble you with. But then I, I developed a large system in which the, the peoples of the world would bring me tribute every month in a form of chocolate. And it would be like the brownie month and the chocolate covered nuts. Yeah, this makes me they brought, but anyway, chocolate, cocoa beans were tribute. During the reign of Montezuma, almost 50,000 pounds of cocoa beans were brought to the capital each year. Sometimes the beans were used like money. Sometimes they were offered to the gods. The Aztecs also used to use cocoa beans to make a frothy drink. The beans were ground in a mortar with corn kernels. Vanilla, honey, chili peppers, and spices were added to the mixture. Then it was whipped with water. <laughs> Ordinary people could rarely afford to drink chocolate. It was a drink for the wealthy. This was more like a bitter coffee drink. You know, you can get, there, sometimes there's, uh, like in this specialty aisle at Hy-Vee, they have chocolate bars with peppers, with like chili peppers with, in it. You should. Tell your parents to buy one of those. You can pretend you're having Aztec chocolate. What are we going to say, Bailey? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that is mostly maple trees in North America, and this was in Mexico, right? But I, you know what, I don't know who it was who got the bright idea of taking sugar and putting it with chocolate, but I'm so thankful. Um, yes, right.
Oh, you mean the, no, they, it was a drink. It was a drink even in Europe for a long time. It was, I don't know, it was surprisingly recently that they started putting chocolate in bars, you know, and, and having it in a solid form. Okay, one, two, three. Um, so try to remember, this is happening at the same time as all the other stuff we've been reading about. It just, it must have been an amazingly, I don't know, confusing time. Wait a minute, I don't, did I give somebody too many? Did I already give you yours? Oh, okay, good. I thought I forgot. Um, it rocked the world. And we are about to start, most for the rest of this school year, we're gonna talk about the other thing that rocked the world and had consequences that we live with to this day. We, we are heirs, obviously we live in that new world. Um, I mean, is there anybody here who was not born in North America? Okay. Um, so we are all heirs of the fact that this, this land was discovered and colonized. We are also heirs of the fact that Christianity is no longer unified. Christians come in, I would say flavors, that makes it sound. We have different faith traditions. We all adhere to the Nicene Creed. It makes us all Christians because there are fringe groups that don't. Sorry, I don't mean to offend, but you know, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses are, are fringe groups that don't adhere to the Nicene Creed. They don't believe that Jesus is really God. All right. Um, at least the Mormons don't. We're going to talk about the Reformation. And what I want to do, I, I don't want to yay raw for this side or that side. Let's talk about what happened because many of us in this room may come from different traditions, you know, but just keeping in mind that we all believe that Jesus is God. He was born of a virgin and he came and died for our sins and he will come back. We all, you know, and so, and so we're Christians. But once upon a time, uh, it was taken very seriously that Jesus prayed for unity. One of the very last things he did before the crucifixion was to pray for unity. And we do not have it. And that is wrong. And I'm not, I'm not blaming any particular entity or group. It's just wrong. We're all to blame. All right. And how did that happen? We're going to talk about that. So I'm going to have you read chapters 11 through 13. It, there's short chapters. Uh, it's not It's not a ton of extra pages, all right? Um, and we're going to start talking about, we've mentioned Martin Luther before, we've mentioned some of these things before, but now we're going to go back and trace um, trace what happened. Um, I Could somebody tall get rid of this for me? <laughs> Just, oh, no, I got it, I got it. Okay, awesome. You take, you take the map, and I'll take the clips, and then you just put the map on the floor over there. Thank you so much. Um, let me talk about what we're gonna, what we're gonna write. We're gonna spend several weeks, um, and then let's, let's talk about King Arthur in the time we have left, which unfortunately isn't much. Um, we, you guys, you know, the Scully group is meeting next week, and then you guys have another spring break. Um, so I, I had this going to be, it was gonna be a two week, assignment, but then the second week you won't be here two weeks from now. So we're just going to, instead of making it fast, we're going to just slow it down. And we're just, you're going to end up having three weeks. So basically, here's what I want you to do this week. I want you to get a piece of paper at home. And I want you to ask yourself this question. Should we have uh, nights and knighthood today. Now, we do have knighthood. Um, in England, they still knight actors and, and scientists and things. I'm not talking about that. It's just, it's just a ceremonial thing. They don't give them a sword and they don't go out and, you know, challenge the green knight of the green lawns. They, they don't do that. They just, they just get a little medal. But I mean, should we have a group of people 
dedicated to roaming the earth and righting wrongs and setting things straight. I want you to have a yes column and a no column. And I want you to think of at least 10 reasons for each. Anything you think of is not too small, all right? Nothing's too trivial. Ask yourself one big question. What would happen? Look at the world the way it is now. What would happen that would make it better? What would happen that could make it worse? I'm not saying that's the only question to ask yourself, but that's a good question. Yeah, Bailey. Say, I don't understand what you said. What is it? You know what? That was mentioned. So, what is the difference between knights and cops? That's no. Don't answer it. Don't answer it for me. Think, think about it. All right, Adeline. Yes. Yes. Although, although you could. You could throw honor, there is a certain level of honor involved. Okay, so those would be, those would be no's. Well, let's see. What is the difference between a policeman and a knight? Here's a second. Rhett wanted to say something. Minimum. No, ma there's no maximum. Okay. Yeah, that, see, that, this, I'm leaving it open-ended for you because what if we had, what if we just imported King Arthur's Knights? What would happen? That would be, that would be kind of weird, but what would be the update? They would have cars, and then you'd say, well, well why is that not like the military and the police? Uh, one thing that comes in my mind is the military and the police are paid for what they do. These knights aren't paid. King Arthur doesn't pay them. Also, also, Think about who would they get their authority from. The, the king just says, yeah, you, you, seem, you seem good. You're in. Whereas think of the training that goes into being in the military and, and the police. So that, that could end up being a no. Like, no, we like the ones we have. They're fully trained. And we've got, it's like Percival, who just is some yokel who shows up and they just hand him a sword. Probably, if they behave that way, definitely. But, yeah, did you have another? Okay, yes, I see the problem. Um, this really hadn't occurred to me when I, this is awesome. Um, I don't care. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can make them, I think they're gonna have to be modernized a little bit or they'll all be put in, you know, institutions. I feel like they might end up or arrested. Um, but think of the, the code also. So by knights also expanded to think of the code of honor, which as Adeline said, you know, there's a code of honor among the military and police. You know, it, it, often it gets broken, but that doesn't mean the code of honor doesn't exist. Heck, the knights were breaking their own code of honor. And that, you know, that didn't mean knighthood didn't exist. I'm just, I'm curious what you're gonna come up with. So here's what we're gonna do. You don't have to write any paper this week. Yes, that's all you're doing. And I want you to bring your reasons back next week and we're gonna hash them out. All right? We're, I would like, I don't think that everybody can give all their reasons out loud, 
but we're going to put some of them on the board together and we're going to communally brainstorm to figure out should we modernize them or not would this work or not all right we're going to explore it a little bit further all right and maybe if you think about it this is something i would hope that maybe you're, by the way you're going to finish the king arthur book this week and as you read you could have this question in the back of your mind how are these people behaving differently than our modern police or the military would they be an addition to our society or would they be redundant because we already have those things um, and jot your ideas down and then let's just come and spill it next week all right does that sound fair okay yes right sure absolutely yes absolutely um, I am so sorry that we ended up with not the time that I had hoped for to talk about King Arthur but before you go we got uh, I keep you a couple minutes you can put your stuff away but does anybody find the Holy Grail thing a little odd I don't know what else to say how did the Holy Grail, by the way, what is the Holy Grail? Yes, yeah, there's two explanations for this actually. Some people say it's the cup that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper. Some people say it's a cup that they had at the crucifixion and they used it to catch drops of his blood. The spear, we find out, you know, that King Pelles got speared because Sir Balin was unworthy and he grabbed the spear and he stabbed him and struck the dolorous stroke. and. This is the spear that pierced Jesus' side. And one might ask, what are they doing in England? It would be a fair question to ask, I feel like. There is a legend, this is part of that legend, that Joseph of Arimathea came to England and built the first church in England. Joseph of Arimathea, remember, is the rich, the, the wealthy man who had a tomb and he, they buried Jesus in his tomb. He was obviously one of Jesus' followers. He didn't just come from nowhere and say, let me bury him in my tomb. He was obviously a, a disciple of Jesus's. And, and that, he, um, that he took these holy items and he brought them to England and built a church and was the first to bring Christianity to England. We really have no evidence for this at all except for stories. Yes, right. Okay, are we? Oh, yeah, did what, what I'm sorry, say okay, now that I know which thing we're talking about, say it again. Okay, that's fine. Are we talking Balin and Pelly's now? Yes. Okay. No. It was just some weird spear levitating in the air. Yes, they did. They did tell him after. Um, so these knights, and obviously these are holy things that only certain worthy people can can touch or encounter and so this is sort of the great test of these nights one thing else I want to point out and then we'll, we'll try to cover more of this hour and a half is never enough time um, Lancelot Lancelot has fallen from honor from his personal honor in the reading that you gave remember he's in love with Guinevere and up to this time, they haven't done anything about it. They just know it is. So she's married, and he goes on trips a lot, just to stay away. Until this Elaine, remember, who lives in the haunted castle Carbonek, that disappears and reappears, where they store, store, store the holy things. She, she's in love with Lancelot, and she magicked. She had herself magicked to look like Guinevere, and spent the night with Lancelot. They got married. Remember the whole marriage thing, how you can just declare yourself married to someone, sort of? She's 
he's already married. And when Lancelot realized what he'd done, he, he's broken all faith with his order of knighthood. Gawain didn't, right? The Green Knight's wife was tempting him. He's like, nope, don't, I don't do that. Lancelot is now fallen from favor. He can't find the Holy Grail. He can't touch it. Remember that as you, as you read the rest. Um, go ahead and finish that. Read the next three chapters and do a list for me and we'll see. We'll argue this out next week. We'll see if we think nights are a good thing or a bad thing today. All right. Bye-bye.